Okay, good morning, everybody. Can I ask everybody to take their seats, please? Good morning. I hope everybody's uh, recovered from last night's night owls and the, the, the fun that followed them. Um, I'd like to invite everybody, welcome everybody to the, today's first panel, Quo Vadis Russia, where is Russia going? Um, and where is Russia going? Will Vladimir Putin's efforts to remake the international order, um, where will they go? What will they result in? What will they mean for international security? What can we expect as Russia enters a new political season and Vladimir Putin enters into what is possibly his final term? Can we expect another round of economic reform? What can we expect politically? Will there be another attempt? Will there be an attempt to diversify Russia's economy away from hydrocarbons? We have a very distinguished panel here to discuss all these issues. Let me introduce them. To my left is Dr. Andre Kuzmin, former chairman of Sperbank. To his left is Dr. Bobo Lobo, Russia Research Fellow at the French Institute of International Affairs. To Bobo's left is Dr. Celeste Wallander, former Special Assistant to the President of the United States from 2013 to 2017 at the National Security Council and President of the U.S.-Russia Foundation for Economic Advancement of the Rule of Law. And to her left is Mikhail Mikhailovich Popov, Deputy, Secre Secur uh, Deputy Secretary of the Security Council of the Russian Federation. Welcome, everybody. To get the discussion going, I wanted to start with you, Celeste. Um, what, the eternal question, what does Putin want? And how does what he wants drive Russia's domestic and foreign policy? And where, where is this likely to lead us? Great. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you also to the organizers of the conference for again inviting me to join uh, this discussion and this group. It's really a privilege and I always learn so much, so I'm very grateful to be here. I think the way to understand what the Russian leadership is, uh, it, its objectives are, is to first understand the nature of the political economic system within Russia. Like all leaderships, political leaderships, the Russian leadership seeks to retain power, but what that means varies by political system. In a democracy, there's a, a process of elections and competition, accountability uh, to voters and the need to speak to the issues uh, and interests that, that the voters can hold them accountable on. In Russia, we've seen over the last 15 years or so, the creation of a system that experts have identified as Putinism, a particular form of authoritarianism in which political power and access to and control of economic wealth and especially rent and rent distribution as at the center of how the political economic system works. In order to have access to wealth and rents, and most importantly, in the system, the ability to distribute rents, to control who gets what, who benefits from um, essentially the resource economy, but not only the resource economy, um, other as elements of the economy, you have to have political power. And to have political power, um, you have to have access to rents, because the Relation, political relationships are built upon personal relationships of trust um, and exchange of access to rents and control of those rents. And that's why the political elite around President Putin is a political elite that he knew, political and economic and financial and um, uh, rent-seeking elite, primarily that he knew and grew to trust and grew to trust him during his years in St. Petersburg. And this, we kind of forget this because now it's so standard. This is now the Moscow elite, but this is primarily the set of people that President Putin knew from not just his security services days, but from the uh, development of the uh, economic and business relationships uh, in St. Petersburg, which were themselves then built on those particular personal relationships rooted in old Soviet structures, particularly the security services. And so in a system like this, what doesn't help and actually hurts the control of political power and therefore the access to and control of rent distribution um, is our transparency, accountability, external factors, 
having to answer for how, for example, private investors are able to vote as shareholders in international boards, uh, um, in, in uh, Russian corporations. Um, certainly not political competition within the country because political competition within the country would undermine these clan-based relationships and these close personal relationships of trust uh, and rent distribution. And so you can't have accountability. Accountability stays inside, it's not outside. And so one of the implications of sort of high Putinism, we could call it, by um, this, the middle of this decade, is that this political leadership, unlike the first sort of decade of Russian political leadership, has um, a contrary interest to the international community in the sense that where the global economy is, where the structures of the global liberal order are, they're based upon rules institutions, transparency, permeability, exchange, competition, the rise and fall of political power, the building and loss of economic wealth. Those kinds of things are not just disadvantageous to wealthy, powerful people inside of Russia, because those kinds of things can threaten wealthy and powerful people in many countries, including democracies. But that global liberal order is fundamentally incompatible with the terms of political power inside of Russia. And so that is why what uh, Brian referred to, this sort of questioning of the global liberal order isn't merely an abstract sort of, we don't like how the global liberal order works. It's because there's an incompatibility with how the Russian political leadership now defines power and its, a and its ability to continue to control power and those global rules of the game. And so this isn't some misunderstanding. This isn't something that you can fix with a summit or two. This is really a fundamental challenge challenge not only to the Russian leadership, and we can talk about how it's chosen to deal with that challenge, um, but also to that global liberal order. Because most countries, including the one I'm a citizen of, um, actually benefit from that global liberal order. It benefit from transparency, from holding leaders accountable, uh, from having uh, co corporations and companies in the economic sector also held accountable. And so we really are at a point in which it's just not just some misunderstanding. It's really going to be around with us for quite some time. Yeah, so this, <clears throat> this is pretty much a, f this, this problem is fundamental. This dilemma, this conflict between Russia and the West over the global international order is essentially fundamental. As you're saying, there's the, the, the needs of the Putin system directly contrast with the needs of the international order. And I, I'm also glad, Celeste, that you brought up Saint, uh, Putin's St. Petersburg time, which I, I, I'm pretty close, uh, very, very familiar with um, and watched him in action in those days. Um, and I think this as important, everybody points to his KGB background as being the, the key to understanding Putin. But if kind of genealogically Putin's a product of the Lubyanka, sociologically, He's very much a product of the wild east capitalism that we saw in St. Petersburg in the 1990s. I wanted to go to, to, to Bobo Lowe now to kind of build on some of the, the points that Celeste makes. Bo, Bobo, is, is Russia equipped to handle the challenge of the 20th century, 21st century? They're trying to change the international order. Um, is this going to be a case of uh, be careful what you wish for, you may get it? Um, thank you very much, Brian. I want to try and answer your question by putting to you, my fellow panelists, and to you, the audience, five propositions. The first proposition is that today's international context presents Russia with greater challenges than at any time uh, since Putin came to power. The defining characteristic of the international context today, in my view, is fluidity. The US liberal, led liberal order is falling apart, but no system, alternative system has emerged to replace it. There's a lot of talk about a multipolar or a polycentric world, but no one really quite under, knows what this means. And really, perhaps the only real certainty today is that the international system, if indeed we can call it a system, is more disorderly than at any time since the end of the Second World War. Now, it's tempting to see Russia as a, a prime beneficiary of this fluid, disorderly context because, after all, what's not to like from Moscow's perspective if there's a vacuum left by a weakened U.S. leadership? But in fact, I would argue that Russia faces enormous challenges, 
growing great power tensions, new threats and forms of confrontation, the challenges of post-industrial development, and of course, the rise of China and other emerging powers. My second proposition follows for, immediately from my first, which is that I believe that Russia is currently very ill-equipped to address these challenges. Ill-equipped in terms of material uh, uh, basis, but also ill-equipped in terms of psychological mental approach. So the Kremlin essentially subscribes to a realist tradition where a few great powers, in a sense, co-manage the international system. But in fact, the 21st century world transcends national boundaries and the uh, boundaries of uh, great power influence. We have global trade flows, ubiquitous information, technological revolution, gathering climate change, de-universalization of norms and values. Now, it's certainly true that the great powers retain critical roles, but the idea that they can somehow establish or impose a great power world order is simply delusional. And I think Russia will find it harder to adapt to such realities because it has an economy nearly 10 times smaller than China. So it cannot rely in the long term on its traditional political and military trumps. It needs to develop its potential in other areas of soft power, high technology, um, food and water security, renewable energy even. More generally, it needs to reinvent itself as a new type of global power, a provider of global goods, rather than as largely a preventative power able to foil Western uh, objectives. Now, third proposition. Putin has demonstrated great tactical dexterity at times, but I would argue that this has come at considerable strategic cost. Because there's no doubt that in some respects, Putin's conduct of foreign policy has been highly successful. He certainly put Russia on the map, like it or not. Russia is a player to be taken account of. And for the Kremlin, and indeed for the Russian public, that is, that's a worthwhile achievement. And another success, if you like to call it that, has been he's been able to convey a sense of Russian purpose at a time when the foreign policies of many Western countries are in disarray. And a third real advantage is that he has managed to marshal Russian public support, that his conduct of foreign policy has become one of the pillars of regime legitimacy. But I would argue that many of these strengths are also weaknesses, that Putin's penchant for the spectacular actually um, hides, it comes at the expense of longer term goals. So take the case of Ukraine in 2013-2014. In a sense, Putin was able to achieve considerable operational success, but ultimately what he did was strategically self-defeating. He's been able to embarrass Western leaders, but paradoxically, Russian influence on US and European decision-making has rarely been lower. And yes, for all the public warmth of the Sino-Russian partnership, Russia is China's junior partner. And I think, more generally, Putin has, been, uh, has failed to make best use of extraordinarily favorable external conditions in to create the material basis for Russia to be a 21st century global power. Now, fourth proposition, I think Putin realizes much of this. He realizes that Moscow cannot, that Russia cannot retain its present course indefinitely. And so he has modified his tactics. He's assumed a more uh, restrained approach with the United States. Um, he understands, of course, that Trump is a weak president and cannot deliver the concessions that Russia is looking for. But most of all, he understands that, like it or not, the United States is by far the most powerful and influential country in the world, notwithstanding the rise of China. So he has to find a way to deal with it at some level. And in Europe, Moscow, I think, is switching its emphasis from the support of far-right movements to actually needing to re-engage with a political mainstream, because that ultimately is where the action is. 
And more generally, Russia is pitching its great power identity in terms of good international citizenship. However, although Putin has modified his tactics, I would argue that Russia's strategic objectives and mindset remain essentially unchanged. And the most important goal here is to assert Russia's central role in regional and global governance. And there will be no compromise on this goal, with or without Putin. Moscow will engage with the West, but on a selective, conditional, and transactional basis. It will seek to build on the strategic partnership with China, but trying to avoid too much of a China dependence. In the post-Soviet space, it will look for ways to reinforce authoritarian regimes and counter democratic influences. And this leads me to my final proposition, which is, in a sense, a statement of the obvious. If Russia is to be a leading power in the 21st century, it will need to embrace fundamental changes in its domestic and foreign policy. But here's the rub. Today, Putin, Russia, faces a modernization dilemma. In order to remain a great power, it will need to reinvent itself, or else it'll face the prospect of a slow but inexorable decline. Because ultimately, there is no independent foreign policy without systemic reform. But the problem here is this. If it is to modernize, this will be a process that will take decades if it happens at all. It will mean revolutionizing the system of political relations and governance. And of course, that kind of transformation is fraught with risk for the regime. But perhaps the biggest task of all is this. It's to change the mindset in Russia about what it means, what it takes to be a great power in the 21st century. It means moving from a historical reliance on traditional methods of projecting power like political standing and military might to embracing more diversified and sophisticated forms of influence. In short, only by being a prosperous country can Russia remain a great power. Thank you very much for that, but you've certainly given us a lot to, to, to chew on here, particularly this, this paradox of modernization, the, 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 the yeah. modernization dilemma. It's just something I want to pick up on further. First, I want to remind everybody that this uh, the conference is also being live streamed. There's, in addition to the audience here, people are, are joining us online. And anybody that would like to join the debate on Twitter, hashtag RigaConf17. Um, I want to move now to Andrei Kosmin um, to talk about I want to actually would like to pick up on this point that Bobo made about the paradox of modernization um, or the modernization dilemma. I call it Russia's paradox of modernization, and I, I, I frame it as follows. You have an economy that's heavily dependent, to put it very mildly, on hydrocarbons, and it's necessary to diversify that economy to become the kind of modern economy that you were talking about that's necessary to, to be a, a, a world power in the 21st century. And I believe Russia knows this, but there's a problem. Because diversifying the economy, decentralizing the economy, creating other independent centers of economic power, by extension, would lead to a more pluralistic political system. And so this is something that is intolerable to the current elite for reasons Celeste pointed out in the very, in the, in the, at the very outset. Um, so you kind of have a paradox here. You have an economic imperative to reform and a political prohibition if you will, on reform. And this is what I, what I call the, the, the paradox of modernization. Andrei, I wonder if you could pick up, can we expect another round of economic reform in Russia? And what would it look like? Will it be successful this time? Thank you. First of all, I think it would be right to mention that since 90s, the word reform is obscene in Russian language. <laughs> and to implement serious reforms, certainly you need not only political will, but public support. So the aftertaste of reforms uh, is still so bitter for the majority of the population uh, that 
it makes your paradox even more, even more hard for decision makers trying to avoid political accents. So I'm an economist and not politologist. I should say it's a extremely complicated mixture of current and strategic challenges, part of them you mentioned. After 2013, it's evident that economic changes are needed drastically since the current state of economy is not meeting the demands of the country. It's, uh, it never happened during the last 20 years that the internal consumption and our retail trade are not growing for four consistent years the real estate crisis is going on and what comes more evident with each case of collapsing banks now, quite big banks, that the financial control and supervision needs significant improvement as quicker as possible. But taking into account political reality and the coming presidential, uh, pres uh, presidential elections, it's hardly possible to await immediate measures right now. I think it would be more realistic to state that the main uh, main issue is the sustainment of stability at all, at all prices and as I mentioned the last cases of three quite big banks in Russia show that the price which is very high would be paid to sustain stability and not to create problems with private depositors. There is immense internal economic domestic ag agenda for Russia, taking into account the real place of the country in various comparisons, which are not quite encouraging. Uh, I think it's worth to remind that, for example, for such index as road network, the country is at the place of number 123rd in the world. So Russia and the internal market needs new road construction. For that you need new investments, you need construction materials, and that exactly the sector which declines after 2014. You have the index of quality of education, of the primary education. Russia is placed at the moment as number 62 in the world ratings, which is also very disappointing, especially if you envisage the necessity to educate a modernized working labor force for the future. Life expectancy, place number 108. It's very, and it, doesn't, it didn't change since the last 15 years. Uh, concluding that row of gloomy figures uh, I do agree that with 
previous statements that to be a modern respected power the country needs a modernized economy but it's extremely hard for the decision makers to start really painful changes especially in the current political reality so at least till the end of presidential campaign uh, I don't think uh, serious measures could be envisaged. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty p bleak picture you, you, you paint there, Andre, although it's one I, I, I would concur with. Um, I, and I would argue that, like I said, it goes even more fundamental. I think there is almost an incapability of conducting economic reform given the current political regime, because economic change will mean political change. And even if this isn't objectively so, they seem to believe this because they seem to be haunted by the, the ghosts of perestroika, if you will, and the ghosts of the, of the Gorbachev period. I want to turn now to Mikhail Popov. Uh, you're the, Mikhail Mikhailovich, you're the, the only representative of the Russian authorities here on our panel today, and you've been listening to all of us go on and on about where Russia is going. So let's, let's, let's get your perspective. Where, where is Russia going? Uh, you know, what is Russia or what is Rutenia? Uh, this question has been asked for more than 1,000 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were a lot of advisors and a lot of uh, people who uh, wanted to uh, uh, make a lot of changes in Russia uh, politics, in Russia internal life, in Russia economics, and whatever. Uh, nowadays, when we discuss the situation in Russia, uh, we are trying to sound uh, uh, very, uh, in very care care careful manner, but uh, nobody mentioned uh, that uh, sanctions which were imposed on Russia. And uh, from this particular point of view, the whole talk here where Russia goes uh, may mean that uh, it's interesting to, s to see whether Russia will stay alive or not as a result of those sanctions and as a result of those politics. Uh, what will be the result? But anyway, uh, uh, there was an uh, idea that uh, there are fundamentals uh, uh, problems between Russia and the West, and um, uh, I would say that uh, sometimes I have to the conclusion that uh, very, a lot of people in the West uh, have, conceived, uh, have uh, uh, to come to a very strange uh, logic uh, regarding Russia and everything what is going on around Russia, and Russia Russian politics or whatever. Uh, and this logic consists of two points. Point one. Russia is to blame for everything. Point two, if by any chance you have an idea that Russia is not involved, immediately go to point one. <laughs> uh, you know, there was, uh, you heard a very gloomy uh, picture of our economic of, of Russia. Uh, uh, partly it's true, partly not. Uh, uh, it is not a secret that Russia inherited uh, a lot of difficulties from the previous time. And we are trying to uh, rebuild Russia on new principles. And by the way, uh, the name of our president was uh, mentioned a number of times. I should remind you that he is officially, constitutionally elected president by majority of the people. And from this point of view, uh, he has very strong positions in Russia, and uh, he is respected as a president, as a man, as a specialist, and a Russian patriot. But you know, the, uh, any development, economic development, cultural development, whatever, 
It depends on the security uh, situation. It uh, depends on the state of uh, security in the area, in the region, in the global scale. Uh, now we are uh, sitting in Riga, wonderful city in the, of the Baltic region. May I uh, come closer to the problems of this uh, area re regarding our position uh, about where Russia is going? First of all, we must set aside ideological prejudice and we must accept the necessity of open and unbiased dialogue in order to maintain stability uh, in the region, first of all. We should acknowledge that there is no direct military threat to the Baltic states. Everyone should refrain from the bad practice of exaggerating the myth of our so-called Russian military aggression. The Russian side is ready to take all the necessary steps to lift the concern of our partners. Second, we must reach consensus on the clear rules of the game, bearing in mind universally acknowledged agreements. There are, first of all, the Vienna document, Helsinki Accords, and of course, Russian NATO Founding Act of 1997. Moscow assumes that the content of these documents is sufficient to maintain the high level of stability and mutual trust in the Baltics and does not require any additional clarifying protocols. At the same time, regional players should join their efforts in order to get close in understanding not only the letter, but also the spirit of these documents. Third, we consider it important to multilaterally and unbiasedly review all mutual claims and concerns related to security in the Baltics. Within the framework of this dialogue, it could be useful to analyze regional military potentials to understand how to jointly prevent militarization of the region. Moscow is sending clear signal that we are ready to start fair negotiations about military doctrines and threats, threats assessment without mutual accusation. We are ready to conduct a comprehensive analysis of both quality and quantity of our national military assets in Europe. Fourth, we should apply step-by-step -step tactics and launch substantive work on particular issues to create conditions for further interaction on common problems. As a platform for dialogue, we could use the Finnish leader Solinini's to initiative on the aviation safety in the Baltic Sea region. Let me remind you that Russia has already supported the mentioned initiative. And finally, strengthening confidence building measures implies not only military activities, but also the cooperation in other fields. Cultural and humanitarian cooperation, as well as various forms of public diplomacy, could promote the restoration of relations and bridging the gaps of mutual mistrust in the region. So, uh, in short, uh, were our proposals. Uh, for, uh, for renewing the uh, new, uh, to renew the level of trust and transparency uh, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail Mikhailovich. And um, I'm going to bring the discussion a little bit further. We've discussed now economic issues, international security issues, mm -hmm. but the, the, the big elephant in the room that we've kind of left out is, is domestic politics, as Russia is entering into a new political season. Um, I'm going to make a crazy prediction and say I, I think Vladimir Putin's going to be reelected in March. I know I'm really going out on a limb here, but I'm going to predict this. <laughs> but I think what we can also add to this, and what I do think, is this, in all likelihood, is going to be Vladimir Putin's last term in the Kremlin. When he completes this term, he will have, again, completed two consecutive terms. The Constitution stipulates that you can serve no more than two consecutive terms. He will be 71 years old when this is over, meaning if you wanted to try another castling move and pull a Medvedev or another Medvedev clone out of the closet to try this, he would be 77 when he would triumphantly return to the Kremlin for what would be a, 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 a fifth term. So in all likelihood, in all likelihood, we're about to enter the very last term of Vladimir Putin. And what does that mean? That means Putin's about to become a lame duck. <laughs> Putin is about to become a lame duck. This is, I mean, do the math. It's, 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 this is the case. Or he's going to 
ignore the Constitution and seek, seek a third consecutive term? Possible. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, as has been discussed a bit in the Russian media lately, there will be a post-presidential position created, especially for Putin, kind of a, a national leader or supreme leader type position that will, will, will allow him to remain de facto in power. But we are about to enter one of those periods of transition in Russia, of succession. And succession is the Achilles heel of the Russian system. There is no set rules, really, for succession. And when we, mo when we move into one of these succession periods, Russia tends to get un unstable. The elite begins to fight with each other. We all remember 1999. Um, living in Moscow at the time, I was fully expecting war to break out in Tverskaya Ulitsa between Yuri Lushkov's office in, 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 the, in, in, the mayor, in the mayor's office in, 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 in the Kremlin. We all remember the Siloviki War of 2007 at the end of Putin's second term in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. We all remember the events of 2011 and the Bolotnaya protests and all of, all, of, all of the intrigue surrounding that in 2011-2012. So we appear to be entering a succession. Celeste, I know we were talking about this yesterday, and we kind of have different views on this, so I'd like to bring you into this. Is Putin becoming a lame duck, or is something else about to go on? Well, the logic of how you lay it, by that logic, he becomes a lame duck. He becomes less powerful. The competition for becoming the successor ensues. And I agree with you that that's kind of the implications of the logic of the existing system, but I would highlight a different logic, the one I uh, or a uh, related uh, logic, which is in some ways in Hegelian classic terms, a, a contradiction, which is that if, if your control of wealth and rents depends on your political power, who guarantees this current elite's uh, control of what they've amassed and have enjoyed over the last 15 years if there's going to be a change in political power? No one. So what are the incentives for this political elite to find some kind of basis for change in succession? You could move around the deck chairs, but then you have two problems. One is whoever ends up with the, the castling move, um, everyone else has to trust that individual, he or her, um, to protect everyone else and to you know, keep the system going. Um, and it's not clear that within the elite, there is that level of trust and confidence. And second, when you talk to people in Russia and the Russian elite, no one truly believes that anyone can do this and do it well um, other than Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And so the whole, even though Putinism is more than just Vladimir Putin, he seems to be an essential element of, it may be not stability, but it's an equilibrium. And if you change the equilibrium, everyone who has won from that equilibrium is at very considerable risk of losing, not just their political job, but their wealth and their safety, and the wealth and safety of their families and associates. And so the stakes are huge. Yeah. And the consequences of making even a small mistake are extraordinary. Um, so even if you could imagine sort of a transition to a, a higher, techni technically a higher office. The Deng or, Xiaoping option, if you will. Or it, it, if there were an option, it would be uniquely Russian. It wouldn't, it wouldn't look like uh, in any other country. Hmm. If you don't have Vladimir Putin as president of the Russian Federation, but more importantly, as the core player in this set of concentric clans, accessing and holding political power, accessing and holding access to rent and rent distribution, you're really changing the very fundamental nature of the system. And it's the anticipation of that change that in which all this instability ensues. And so no one wants to take that step. And I just have trouble imagining I don't, I don't mean this disrespectfully. I, I try, I'm trying to do it analytically. I have trouble imagining Vladimir Putin thinking through someone he trusts <laughs> to hand those reins over to, to protect himself and the people he cares about. Because he, and many in the Russian elite, often refer to other such transitions in other countries and political parties, not as a good thing, but as a very dangerous thing. And the justification, for example, for not having discussions about a political transition in Syria ahead 
of uh, a, a resolution to the Civil War are cast by the Russian elite in exactly these terms, that no one can guarantee Assad and his family will be safe, and therefore to expect him to commit to go before you begin um, a, a negotiation on the end of the Civil War is unreasonable. So I just, I think there's a trap. I think the strength of Putinism is this kind of identity of political and economic power, um, and it allows uh, very uh, proactive foreign policy and a very strong control of the political system inside, but it, the very strength is the weakness. And I, I don't see a, a succession process that um, is acceptable to the people who have power. So you're saying he can't leave. Putin can't leave. Not only is he not a lame duck, he cannot leave. He's a prisoner of the Kremlin. I, I would hesitate to ever say something can never happen. I've seen too many things happen that we <laughs> didn't. But the implications of the, of the decision to leave, uh, it seems to me, is that you'd have a fundamental change away from Putinism inside Russia. To what? Not necessarily a more liberal uh, pluralism yeah. or accountable political process, but I don't see how Putinism contains within it a succession process that leaves that system standing. Now, this has long been the Achilles heel of, 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 of the Russian system. Another thing that's interesting about this is that one part of Putin's legitimacy is based on the fact that he's largely perceived as the indispensable man. Yeah. But the fact that we're even having this discussion, and we're not the only ones having this discussion, I mean, you see this, this discussion coming up in, in, in the Russian media increasingly now even in kind of pro-Kremlin tabloids like Moskovsky Komsomolia, it's shockingly. Yeah. Um, so the very fact that we're kind of talking about the world after Putin or the possibility of the world after Putin, or if there can be a world after Putin, we're no longer t thinking about him as indispensable anymore, which takes away a bit of his legitimacy. I wanted to turn to our two Russian colleagues on this, on this very question, um, because you have, you have the most stake in it. Mikhail Mikhailovich, how does this work? Is, is, is Putin becoming a lame duck? Can he leave the Kremlin? How do you, will, will, the, will, will this play out strictly according to the Constitution? What, how do you see this playing out? You know, you put me in a very difficult position. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's my job. That's, 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 uh, that's why I'm here. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, because as a uh, government employee, I have to observe certain rules. Uh, but on the other side, uh, you know, I uh, have heard very carefully and um, uh, with big interest all the discussion. Uh, and uh, I uh, started to respect my President Putin even more. <laughs> uh, because because uh, you uh, discussed his uh, uh, role in, the, in our country, in the world, uh, on such a big level of respect uh, that uh, it, it looked like a, a part of a, a presidential campaign in Russia, you know, vote, vote for Putin. And, uh, for, for, uh, for, but uh, it may be a kind of a joke, uh, you, uh, you understand it, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I think uh, that we are digging to deep and uh, running too fast uh, because we shall live and we shall see what will happen. Nowadays we'll try to write a kind of a fantasy what will happen uh, after seven years of uh, something. Uh, situation in the world is uh, developing on, you know, so rapidly uh, that um, if you remember the uh, first conferences of Riga conferences, today we have 12, 12th conference. What you discussed on the first conference or even on the 10th conference, uh, at, at that time a lot of problems which we face now, they did not exist. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would recommend to all of us to be a little bit patient and wait what will happen next. Okay, thank you, sir. Andre, you are, you are not a uh, government official, so I will not be putting you in a difficult position. Um, how do you see this, this coming transition playing out? Well, uh, repeating, I am an economist. 
mm -hmm. and you're provoking. So me therefore, you to, are to give to give political <laughs> evaluations. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I, but however, I do not agree with any uh, definitions, particularly in this case, uh, because uh, to judge and to speculate on the future of the Russian president uh, just from formal legal framework is a mistake. And secondly, I do think if you read especially some thick books on um, in the years in, of 18th century, 19th century, you would be relieved, uh, paradoxically relieved, that despite all gloomy economic problems, Russia is conducting in its own order without great significant changes for years. It's a very stable order. And it would be also a mistake to, to make extreme personified or personalized uh, appointments. So even if some changes on political level would come true in six years. So the basic structure, it's my conservative opinion, mm -hmm. will not change drastically. Because, because of the traditions of this country, because of its dimensions, and uh, the position of the majority. So whether it's a bad news or good news, it's for you to decide. But I think it's relieving somehow. So you're saying sistema astayotza is essentially yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> Bobo, let's go to you. Is Putin a lame duck? Same question. Or is Celeste right? He can't leave. He's stuck. I agree with Celeste, essentially. But um, I wouldn't use the term lame duck. Mm -hmm. um, I think six years is a long time. I think 72 is still young. So, I also mm -hmm. think that I would use a very different term to lame duck, and which is God or quasi-God. In other words, Putin is a great believer, it seems to me, and he's gone on record as saying this. He thinks he's infallible. He thinks he's indispensable. He doesn't feel he's made any mistakes in, during his presidency. So I think... He sees himself almost, if we, if we were to sort of pick examples from elsewhere in, in the world and in world history, not of any one single figure like Deng Xiaoping, but maybe a combination of Deng Xiaoping, Li Kuan Yu, and the Ayatollah Khomeini. So just really a com but all that adds up to someone who is the father of the nation, who embodies the spirit of the nation in its strategic and political culture, and who must stay, therefore, can never leave. So, because the, if you say, well, he, what happens uh, when his presidential term finishes? I think he finds another position. Or well, he doesn't find a position. He develops such a sort of a political aura, almost a quasi-mystical presence, standing over the nation and its history and its future. And so I think that is where I see things going. But I cannot see, what, what would he do after, if he if pursued a, a sort of a normal conventional retirement? Where would he retire to? What could he retire to? There is nothing to retire to. There's nothing that would guarantee him and the elite's interests if he, um, uh, if he were to leave. So that's why he will stay in some form, even if it is as partly spiritual, partly material presence. I want to stick with this, because I think this is a, a really central and really important issue, because these same discussions were going on in 2011, 2012. Hmm. 
The same discussions were happening. Will the, then the question was, will Medvedev serve a second term as president, in which case Putin's eventual return would have been very unlikely. Sure. And there was talk at that time of Putin taking on this, this Deng Xiaoping supreme leader type role. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of talk of this. Um, but it didn't happen. Right. And why didn't it happen? It didn't happen because the institution of the presidency in Russia is extremely powerful. And there wasn't enough confidence. I don't believe, and I'm of course not inside the man's head, but for what my, my reading of the, of the Russian press and what I call signals intelligence on this suggests to me that, that he just didn't, wasn't confident enough that he could rule the nation without the chair of the presidency. This, so in this case, what does he do? Does he, via, does he tear up the constitution and stay in? But think about the context. In, when Medvedev served his presidency, number one, Medvedev had no significant independent political constituency. Note that Putin picked Medvedev and not Sergei Ivanov or Igor Sechin. So he thought, look, I'll pick someone who, who really has no independent credibility. But also, Putin had only been in power for eight years at that time. Also, it had just uh, occurred during, in, the, in the immediate wake of the global financial crisis and considerable economic and political uncertainties in Russia. Now jump to the present situation. Putin has been in power for 17 years. He is much more, uh, he, he's consolidated his authority to a far greater extent. So he may still go for the Medvedev option, but I actually think that he, um, I mean, I don't think he's going to break the Constitution because he's a stickler for legalism. Mm -hmm. and on, that, on that article of the Constitution, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, it's, you rule by, by law. The other article, not so much. Yeah. But. but I think that's, he, he sees himself as absolutely indispensable in a way that I think there was still perhaps some doubts in that 2008, 2012 period. But also he saw that the Medvedev presidency meant um, a bit of a, 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 loss of, uh, a loss of authority. He couldn't quite control him, even a weak individual like Medvedev. Can I, so, yes, I, 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 I know you want in. to get to the audience, and you should just, on exactly this, generally, um, at least of the Russian leadership elite that I'm aware of and have spoken to in discussions reading Russian press, the Medvedev experiment in sort of transfer of power succession is viewed as a failure and as having been dangerous. Remember that it was viewed as, first of all, leading to Russia's abstention on the UN Security Council resolution on Libya and Medvedev was criticized publicly by then Prime Minister Putin for that, for caving into the Americans on that one. Um, and the, the protest, although America is blamed, Russia, Russia's not blamed for everything. America is blamed for Bolotnaya, um, specifically <laughs> Secretary Clinton was. There's also a, you know, a sense in the Russian elite, in the leadership, that the reason why there were protests, why there was you know, sort of incipient pluralism, at least in Moscow, was because of the Medvedev experiment. So the Medvedev experiment is not viewed as something that you want to try again. Yeah. And I don't mean the person of Dmitry Medvedev, who actually you know, was a, is a very capable and experienced I individual. The, the, the very idea of risking putting someone else with that kind of power, presidential power, even though the assumption was behind him, of course, was the real power, it didn't work. And it created these foreign policy risks and these domestic risks. So it's not viewed as like 20, 2024, we'll just figure, we'll pick the right person next time. No, no, no. The, the very process created uh, what are perceived to have been great dangers. Well, I think what was happening was that there was a genuine debate in the elite about the way forward. And there were those in the elite, like Gleb Pavlovsky, like Surkov, who were arguing for kind of a, a, a transition to a kind of a managed pluralism. And for Putin to kind of stand above the system as the supreme leader or national leader or whatever you want to call it, but to let the system kind of take over. And you have normal presidential transitions. You have managed pluralism, if you will. Now, that side of the elite lost the debate very, very clearly. Um, but what happened wasn't necessarily preordained. And 
there's no reason to think it will repeat again this time. It will be the result of a, another debate that I expect to be happening inside the elite over the next six years, which is again why I use this, this lame duck term because I mean it to, to, to say that we're going to kind of have this period of elite infighting, clan warfare, but also a debate about the future. What next? But Brian, that six years is really a long time. Six years is a long time. Particularly in, in Russian politics. So, I mean, I, I, this is where I, I agree with uh, Mikhail Popov, uh, so, that, you know, in a way, it's premature to speculate. I, I, I sometimes wonder whether we're approaching this from, a, as it were, a Western rationalist perspective. <laughs> and we tend to sort of naturally think, you know, oh, well, look, that's the logical thing to do. We at, transplant our own political experience onto, mm. in, into a Russian context. It strikes me that Russia, there's a, sometimes a lot of wishful thinking here, that Russia isn't as strong as it thinks it is, but it's not quite as weak as we sometimes portray it as as well. Well, that, yeah, it's, it's never as strong as it looks and it's never as weak as it yeah. looks. That, 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 that much is true. But I guess I would say, when do we, when, if six years is too long of a time frame, I mean, the six-year time frame is because that's the presidential term. It, supposed to be his last one and so that's the period but when do we get into that two years three years four years I mean I don't I don't know I expect the jockeying to start immediately to be honest but on that note let's throw it out to the audience for questions I want to uh, stress please everybody form your question in the form of a question there has to be a question mark at the end um, so uh, this gentleman here let's take three and then we'll, we'll go from there this gentleman here in the red tie and the glasses right there in the front <laughs> and, and then uh, Anders is right next, right next to him. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I'm looking around the room. Here we go. James Scher, over here. I'm Mikhail Krutikin, an oil and gas analyst from Moscow, Russia. I think we are discussing a problem that doesn't exist at all. Uh, power transition in Russia can be very smooth. You uh, just seem to forget how Mr. Putin came to power. For the majority of the people, he was a nobody, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just uh, some guy, some retired KGB colonel with a criminal past in the St. Peter's <laughs> mayor's office and a falsified d dissertation. And, uh, well, take a look at him now. Uh, I think if he has to go from power, Russia has quite... Uh, a lot of retired KGB colonels to replace him, and no, nobody would notice. Thanks. Uh, Anders Aslan. Thank you. I have a question for Andrei Kazmin. You mentioned uh, two big banks have just gone under, two of the five biggest private banks. Uh, Bank three. At, three. Uh, Rostos, Bank at Kriti, Bin Bank, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yugra Bank also. So, what do you expect next? It was very uh, critical. What will happen in the banking sector and what will be the response from the central bank? You have been very old. If I may also turn to uh, Mr. Popov. There has been much talk about the new US uh, uh, Russia sanction law of uh, the 2nd of August, in particular, the new very far reaching. Uh, reporting requirements and it's assessed that Russia has 800 billion dollars of offshore assets, private assets. How will the Russian elite react to this, do you think? Thank you. Okay, and James Scher over here has a question. Thank you. I'd like to return, I'd like to take the modernization dilemma in a different direction. The one area that has received intense strategic focus has been military policy. In an open lecture last year, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, General Mark Milley, said that even for the United States, it was ex would be extremely difficult to imagine the technologies and capacities that will be relevant to, will be relevant to war waging in 20 years' time. When you hear that forecast from that man, you realize in 20 years' time, without fundamental change in the Russian economy, Russia will not be in that competition. The problem, and here, now I'm getting to my question, the problem is that the last person to realize this at a similar moment in Russian history was Mikhail Gorbachev, and he ended up losing the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a major uh, influence now 
on thinking in Russia about reform. Do you agree? How does one get out of this dilemma? So I'd be interested in all of your responses to that. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's take those one at a time. There was one uh, directed at you, Andre. I guess we'll tackle that one first, um, the, the question of the, the crisis in the banking uh, sector that, that, that Anders asked. Um, how do you see that? There is talk of a liquidity crisis right now, a very serious liquidity crisis. Uh, well, the reaction of the central bank shows that uh, that definite that it's definitely in favor of doing everything to sustain stability or the private depositors market first of all because banking instability would be the last uh, wished thing to happen before 2018 so all these three banks got uh, got substantial financial inflows from the central bank and uh, no, no panic happened on the market despite the general nervousness of market participants. What is, what is rarely discussed what, what re regarding the banking and financial sector is the existing problem of overvalued ruble since 2016, uh, the ruble remains overvalued, and the last, uh, the last statistics, so for example, in 2017, first five months, the surplus of foreign trade of Russia is more than $57 billion. Uh, what, what, what implications that have on the economy? So, but the interest rates, despite the recent decrease of the prime rate to 8.5% of the central bank, it still sounds a bit um, surprisingly for Western ears, 8.5% considered to be a low rate now. So to, to, to make a comparison, so that makes the ruble uh, denominated financial instruments highly profitable for uh, currency speculations. Uh, currently, 10 year bonds denominated in rubles bring 8.5% of interest in comparison to about 2% of US Treasury bills. So that, that proceeds to carry trade business, carry trade business which is, well, which is really big. Uh, so the, the foreign banks, for example, despite all sanctions and restrictions, uh, invested about $30 billion in Russian denominated bonds. Uh, the Russian banks followed that pattern, and if the margin remains under 6%, this business will flourish further on. Uh, what the implications? So the, the real economy lacks the investment because it's so easy uh, to, to make money from nothing. And uh, so the overvalued ruble makes the export decline. Uh, the whole, um, and the, 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 the development of internal market would suffer. These are the results. And central bank knows about this problem, but it's very hard to undertake anything anything immediately and it would be hardly possible and wishful to do that but the situation is developing in a rather dangerous direction like it did in 1998 maybe so cushioned by the fact that there is no foreign indebtedness of that volume at the moment thank you who wants to tackle the question on, on the military and economic reform that, that James shared, which I think is the next one. I think that's tailor-made for you, Bobo. Okay, I'll give it a go. Um, I just wanted to just make a quick comment on uh, Mikhail Krutikhin's uh, comment about <laughs> succession not being a problem. I, I, in 1999, I was serving in the Australian Embassy in Moscow, and uh, I remember when Putin was, a, uh, was appointed as uh, Prime Minister, it was almost that this was... They'd, they were, they'd run out of all options, that he was the last person 
that they could have picked, that they tried everyone else, so they were looking for someone, and they were casting around in some sort of desperation to find that person, someone sufficiently weak, sufficiently beholden, uh, manipulable, they thought. Um, jump forward to 2017 or 2023 or 24, I think the situation is very different. I think that the, the, the context is very, very different. And I think it'll be rather harder just to pluck someone from the street, so to speak, and put them in, in, in the job. But on modernization, the, the problem is that uh, uh, the challenge of modernization for Russia is, it, is not really one of specific prescriptions. You know, they need to pursue rule of law, diversified economy. Um, yes, that is part of it. But I, I see modernization as much as a, a kind of mindset, recognizing the need for change rather than necessarily following specific prescriptions. Because there are different modernizations in the world. We've seen one of the most remarkable modernizations in history in China, where all the sort of usual Western rules of modernization have been largely ignored. Um, now for, but you have to recognize that there is a problem, and you have to recognize the need to take at least some steps to fundamentally change the system. And in many respects, that's what China has done over the last 35 years. Um, so Russia, in a sense, needs, uh, to a certain degree, follow the Chinese example, at least to the point of recognizing that change is inescapable if they are to be a global power in the 21st century. Um, but also, speaking of China, there's a, a natural Western centrism in the Russian political elite. They see the West as, as particularly the United States, as the strategic reference point. Now, what they need to do when they think about modernization is the competition is not the West. It's not the West trying to do Russia down. It's the guys coming up on the rails, namely China and other emerging powers. So basically, Russia has to get used to the idea that they're going to operate in an increasingly complex, disorderly, and thoroughly competitive world. And I think that's what they're still needing to make that adjustment. And there's still some way off. And the trouble is, and this is my last point on modernization, if they don't modernize, if Russia doesn't modernize, it's not like it's going to collapse in a heap necessarily, because there's a fundamental resilience to Russia. But the problem is, it once was put to me by the economist Vladimir Mao, and he's, he, he was talking in terms of Russia could be like 20th century, 21st century Russia could be like 16th century Spain. In other words, the superpower of its era, or one of the great powers of its era, but in the space of 150, 200 years, becoming an ill-considered regional backwater. And that, is, that I think, is the, the, the threat that Russia faces, a long, uh, slow, but inexorable decline mm into a regional backwater if it doesn't get its act together. Bringing up the issue of China, actually I want to do, pull our two themes together. China solved its succession problem, and that allowed it to focus to a large degree on economic reform. I, think those, I, I don't think those two things are unrelated. Celeste, I, want, I know you wanted to jump in here. To, on James's actual point, which was about mi military and, and defense and its implications and modernization, I. I do think that the Russian leadership faces a challenge that because the economy has, you know, isn't growing sufficiently and isn't generating uh, national wealth, it generates rents, but it doesn't generate national wealth, that over the long time they are going to face some challenges in, with uh, technological change, new challenges. I, I agree with your premise, but, it's, but it, I, I think it doesn't have the same fundamental implications that it did for the Soviet Union in the Gorbachev period. Because Russian military modernization, the, the modernization that's been undertaken and implemented in the last 15 years or so, has not been a modernization driven by matching the United States weapon system for weapon system across the board, but actually has been, in my view, has been much better thought through about creating capabilities that Russia needs for the kinds of scenarios that its leadership thinks are important. 
And so there hasn't been a focus on having to match every US weapon system across the board, but actually investing in the kinds of capabilities that can enable the Russian military to implement um, implement the, its military doctrine. So, and including asymmetric capabilities of all sorts, and not, you know, the hybrid blah, 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 but asymmetric capabilities in the nuclear realm, kinds of capabilities that Russian leadership, uh, military and defense leadership calculates it needs to sustain, you know, mutual assured destruction. Conventional capabilities that are in some ways, um, you know, look like some of the capabilities the United States military is um, uh, invested in, but actually are have a different shape and a different focus. So I, I think they probably will be able to escape the, the trap that the Soviet leadership fell into of constantly trying to match the US across the board. Um, but that doesn't solve the fundamental problem, which you pointed to, I agree with you, that the aspiration to play that kind of role and the importance of the military instrument, the military in Russian foreign policy is likely not going to be matched by the economic base of national power over the long run because of all these the challenges we've talked about and the inability to fundamentally uh, follow change in modernization. And I don't like the word reform either. I think we should think of it as change in modernization. Every economy is changing every day. Even the, que the question is, do you, you know, is there political uh, support for modernizing uh, political and economic structures to match that change? Yeah. All right, I see many hands. I'm taking note of them all. I'm going to tr do my best to get everybody in. Konstantin Egbert, uh, you, you, you have the first question. After that, we'll go to Arkady Ostrovsky and then back to Anton Lysenkov in the back there. Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, Konstantin Egbert, I have a small remark and two questions to two different parts of the panel. Uh, a remark is actually to Bobo Lo. I understand, Bobo, you've spent the last 15 years studying China rather than Russia, but um, I'm quite surprised this idea of having a Russian Deng Xiaoping uh, I think that uh, we do not have the sufficient Chinese immigration in Russia uh, to have a great leader working in the shadows. I think in Russia it's a different tradition. Out of chair, out of mind, out of power. Um, and the two questions are actually one to uh, Andre, and uh, that is about the looming threat of new U.S. sanctions uh, next year after the review period. Uh, if uh, one of the provisions there uh, are implemented, namely ban uh, or sanctions against companies and banks buying Russian sovereign debt, uh, Russian bonds, how it could affect the Russian economy and decision making? That is the question to you. And the question to both Celeste and, uh, and Bobo is actually a bit rhetorical. Uh, um, <laughs> this whole panel was all about just one person, President Putin. Why Western leaders and Western analysts keep you know, thinking about or keep treating the Russian people as if they're some kind of DHL parcel <laughs> left in a stranded in Frankfurt airport. <laughs> what about uh, the demonstrations that went across Russia this year in dozens of cities headed by Alexei Navalny? We have uh, someone like Vladimir Karamurza in the audience. All these people working for change in Russia. So do you think public opinion really doesn't matter? Do you think that Russians will just follow where they are being led? Both to, to you, to Celeste, and to, to Bobo. Thank you very much. Oh. And now we have Arkady Ostrovsky as a question here. Yeah, um, Arkady Ostrovsky with The Economist. Um, a very short question. Um, we're almost at a hundred um, years mark from the uh, October to 1917 revolution. On the streets of Moscow, there is any, you know, hardly any sign of marking the occasion. Um, which suggests that, um, you know, it's kind of, don't talk about the white element, uh, white elephant, you know, kind of, but people are clearly thinking about it. So the question is, what, what relevance do you think the events 100 years ago in terms of the loss of legitimacy of the last Russian Tsar, of the beginning of the disintegration of the Russian Empire, have to today's leadership in the country. If you could try to have a guess wow. about what are the lessons, if you're sitting in the Kremlin today, looking 100 years back at Nicholas II and the ensuing events, what are the lessons that you want to draw from that? What is the relevance of those events? Thank you. Okay, and we have back in the back here. Get, get a mic over there, please. <laughs> 
this is this side of the room is getting discriminated against because all the mics are over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anton Lysenkov, Spectre Press. Well, uh, I think that the, the whole question of uh, succession in Russia is largely overestimated. Uh, in my belief, Vladimir Putin runs the country full stop and will continue to run the country. The only question is how it will be designed and organized. And my question, what it, does it really change? I mean, the ways it will be designed and organized, how it changes uh, the relationships between Russia and the, and the, and the outer world. And uh, uh, another question is really, uh, do you really think that uh, Kremlin and the Russian power does represent the people of Russia fully? Okay, um, let's take, I guess again, we had one directly directed at you, Andre, on the, um, the pot potential of new sanctions. And then the, do the Russian people matter? And I have a couple things to say about that as well. Um, I, I actually plead guilty on that. I think we didn't pay enough attention to that. But sure. Andre, why don't you take the, take the tackle the sanctions issue? Well, uh, it's always very hard to judge whether they will be implemented that way as it was defined and when they will be implemented and how. That depends a lot what, what the implication would be. If that happens, certainly it would be hard for the Russian bond market, it would be hard for Russian banks. It would not be, uh, so to say, uh, an unsolvable problem for the central bank. That is my mind. But, but, but certainly for, for, for the economy, for the normal economic order, it could do a lot of uh, harm. Thank you. Okay, and um, I want to thank Konstantin for bringing it up because I do think we didn't, we didn't spend enough time talking about the opposition, we didn't spend enough time talking about Alexei Navalny, and we certainly didn't spend enough time talking about the Russian people. As I'm looking on the Twitter feed here, I see Mr. Navalny was arrested again, surprise, surprise. <laughs> but yet, this man does seem to be walking along a, a, a certain path. Um, he seems to be the only person seriously challenging the regime. Um, and he seems to be tapping into an anger that is out there, especially among the younger generation. What about that, Bobo, Celeste, and anybody else that would like to jump, jump in on that? Um, uh, shall I? How do the Russian people Before you do that, I, I was misquote. Someone put in quote something I didn't say. Could you, like, <laughs> take that down? I did not say anything that's in there. I did not say that Russia is not primarily competing with the U.S. I said it wasn't driven by, to matching the U.S. weapons system from Western s system. Whoever wrote that, you should take a mea culpa at misqu <laughs> misquoting someone who was heard by so many people in a big room. Yeah. Okay. Um, i just ad address a few things here. Um, Kostya. Um, the, I'm not saying Putin, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying Putin is Deng Xiaoping. But I think he sees himself in a similar kind of father of the nation, indispensable to the nation role. So aspiration is important. You talk about out of chair, out of mind. But in Putin's mind, he is the indispensable, the infallible man necessary to uh, his country's future. And for, for the moment, at least, that's enough. Um, I also think Putin is, it, you, you talk about over-personalizing Putin, and it's a fair point. Putin is a product of broader influences, a broader uh, elite culture, um, a broader strategic and political culture. So I sometimes feel that uh, in the West we're guilty of thinking, well, if Putin, uh, something unfortunate happens to Putin, then uh, Russia will change. And I think that is a, uh, a naive um, illusion. I think uh, he, rep he came to power and he, he is, has managed to stay in power because he represents certain things that have broader appeal. Which brings me to popular legitimacy, public attitudes. It's not so much that the Russian public, as you know, think that Putin walks on water. It's rather that they don't see an alternative. That he is, in a sense, that there is no realistic alternative, partly because Putin has made it that way. Um, but also, this, 
that what he has done is he is a remarkably good communicator. He's a much better communicator than many uh, other uh, past Russian leaders and, and many in the and present political elite. So he knows, in a sense, how to connect with people, and that means that he has been able to position himself as the one truly necessary guide to the future of this country. But this comes back to Brian's point about lessons from... Uh, uh, well, uh, no, Arkady's point about um, lessons from uh, 1917. I think Putin is, uh, it is an embarrassment, obviously, 1917. How do you handle it? Um, but I think the lessons to be learned are this. Don't fight unnecessary wars. That's one lesson. Be accountable to the public. You don't have to run a democracy, but you do need to be sensitive to public attitudes. And one thing that is noticeable about the Putin regime is they conduct endless numbers of surveys to really test public attitudes on a whole range of issues. So you need to, just because you're not a democracy doesn't mean that you're not susceptible to public opinion and that you're not accountable. You also need to give the people something to bite on. So if you can't assure their material well-being, B, give them something to be proud of. And this is where foreign policy comes in. This is where Crimea comes in. Run rings around your Western counterparts because then at least you look good. And Russia, well, the world may hate us, but that's okay. At least they're paying attention. And that's a good thing. And really, um, you know, just ultimately crush or somehow suppress realistic opposition. So you can allow little outlets of dissent but really, essentially, ultimately, everything is controllable. So I think those are the lessons from 1917. All these things Tsar Nicholas II was unable to do. Along these lines, I want to throw a, a comment, a question that came in via Twitter that is going in along these lines. Quote, why are the panelists treating the Russian people like sheep? What about Navalny and those protesting for change? Celeste, do you want to tackle that? Did, did you, I know you wanted to add something to what, what Bobo was saying. But so, uh, you know, I, first of all, I... I I don't think that I, I or, or Bobo or in, anyone characterized uh, the whole Russian political system as mm. solely driven by Vladimir Putin. I explicitly referred to the political system as one of Putinism and talked about other actors. I didn't name them, but talked about, well, I did name one, but um, so, but that is the reality of the political system that there is. We could talk, and I disagree with you a little, but the Russian leadership does pay attention to polls. It is sensitive to public opinion, but it's not accountable. Right. If, if public opinion drives against them, then those, those, the reason you see protests is because their votes don't matter. Because you don't have political competition in political parties where if you don't like how things are going, you can go out and vote for a different political party and a different political leadership. Let's you know, keep in mind that there's a difference between expressing your views and then being able to take meaningful political action based on those views, okay, okay and interests. Um, and the Russian political system right now, doesn't mean it can't change, but right now it's such that public opinion cannot translate into political action in the, in the version of voting that would matter. Now, that is one of the reasons why political action that, the political action that matters at this point is when there are protests, and those are important uh, to understand political dynamics, uh, the attempts to express uh, different views, and the attempts to hold a leadership accountable, uh, but it's not through the processes that are characteristic at, at the core of democracy. So it's not that we're ignoring the opposition or the Russian people, but we're talking about the question put to us is, what will succession look like? It won't look like um, the Russian people choosing who the next president of Russia will be. I think I take little. I take no pleasure in that. I'm, uh, but that, and if someone else has a different view, if someone else thinks that the March 2018 election um, will work, play out differently, um, that that would be really interesting to hear how that uh, argument is. But I, I just don't. I don't see it under the present circumstances. And that is not meant to be an argument that the Russian people shouldn't be uh, uh, following events, gaining access to information, formulating their own interests and ideas. And it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be you know, regional and uh, uh, political activity. Um, it, it's not an argument that it doesn't 
uh, it's wrong. It's that it's not going to affect what happens in March 2018. It's probably not going to affect, um, although modesty that six years is a long time, it's probably not going to affect how this plays out in 2024. So um, I just I think that's worth clarifying. We have the gentleman here. We're going uh, five minutes left, and I'm under strict orders to end at 11 o'clock sharp. So we go to the gentleman here I'm and the lady uh, in the front row. General Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, Germany, and uh, Potsdam University. I have three brief questions. Very brief, please. Yes, very <laughs> brief to the <laughs> Deputy Secretary of the Russian Security Council. One, I am among those who believe that uh, security in Europe in the long run cannot be organized without or against Russia, but only with Russia. But for many, nowadays, security from Russia is a priority again. Do you think that is in Russia's interest? And don't you think that uh, Russia should actively contribute to the reassurance of its small neighbors instead of making them uh, nervous? Second, Bobolo referred to Russia as a preventative power. Would not acceptance as a great power require uh, constructive contributions to regional and global problem solving, like in the almost uh, singular case of the Iran uh, nuclear deal, instead of relying on nuisance power, prevention force, military surprises, fear of neighbors, etc. And thirdly, are not proposals from the Russian side for confidence building quite hollow as long as Russia denies its active military involvement in eastern Ukraine with military personnel, tanks, artillery, and rocket launchers. And although they sound like it, these are not rhetorical questions. And the lady in the front row here who's been patiently waiting. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Lisa Peist, and I'm an analyst working out of Estonia, mostly on cyber issues. And I'll be short because I am, let's face it. Uh, my question is as a follow-up to something that Pobolo has said a couple of times or hinted at, which is, are we really in the right framework for analysis for understanding Russian and Russia-Western relationships? Because this discussion seems to partially have gone off the rails, or have we not gone off the rails by assuming Russia has a top-down sort of chain of command, a la Western policy textbooks, whilst painfully aware that no Western policy textbook can be followed in any Western country. And that fails to give Russia credit for what it is, which is reactive and opportunistic and incredibly integrating it, integrative of you know, information, cyber, economic means in this factions trying to constantly prove themselves. So my hypothesis instead it would be that we're in this constant state of Warfare where factions in turf wars in this phase of succession are almost throwing spaghetti at the wall and the regime owns the spaghetti that sticks. So, especially behind Mihailovich, but to all the other panelists, are we not undermining the, mining this whole discussion by the wrong framework of assuming a top down approach in Russia, whereas mm -hmm. Russia actually has justified sovereign national interests and is throwing spaghetti at the wall? And final question. Hopefully we have to be very quick because we've got three minutes Stephen to go. Stephen Dale, Institute for Statecraft in London. Uh, I'm going to take the, the Navalny and the people issue one step further. No one's quite gone this far yet. I suggest, and I would be very interested in comments on what really worries the Russian leadership is the question of bunt, of some sort of uprising. Something happens in Russia. It's yeah. not necessarily around a Navalny demonstration. Right. It could be, as there was in Birilyova in Moscow, a region I know well, four or five years ago, where a Nazari killed a Russian and thousands of people demonstrated against him. They were fighting his areas. Thousands and thousands of troops and uh, interior ministry forces were sent in to quickly keep the peace. I suggest to you that that is something, that that sort of spontaneous outbreak of violence is what really has got them worried because if that happened and that spread, they don't know how to cope with it. Okay, I'm under strict orders now to, to wrap it up quickly, so I want to ask each panelist to lightning fast uh, response to the question of your choice because we're up against it. Okay, shall I start? Uh, General, I fully agree with you that uh, security in Europe uh, should be built uh, together with Russia by all means, and as far as I uh, remember in my short uh, introduction speech, I uh, proposed uh, five points 
uh, which are aimed at creating a new atmosphere of security uh, in, in Europe and especially in the Baltic region. Thank you. Okay. Um, so it's exactly because the Russian uh, leadership, political leadership has made votes irrelevant that they have to worry about protests. It's ex that's exactly why. Um, that's one of the, 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 the nice democratic theory reason for elections, which is the right reason for elections, is so that citizens can choose their leaders and hold them accountable. Uh, the sort of more sinister reason is that lets off steam so that you don't create the conditions for revolution and protest. So I very much agree that that uh, is uh, a concern, which is one of the reasons why there are all, there's all this polling going around to try and figure this sort of thing out. On the top-down versus tactical, those are not contradictions. Exactly. You can have a top-down political system, but that political leadership is very good at tactical responses. And, and I think that's exactly what characterizes uh, the, the current Russian leadership, that um, those things very much go together, can go together. They don't necessarily go together, but they can. Yes, I, I agree with Celeste. You can be top down, but you can improvise. Putin, uh, they sometimes say he's a chess player. No, he's a poker player playing a weak hand. But that's still him making the decisions. It just happens that he... We shouldn't believe him when he says, you know, I, I foresaw all this. No, he did not foresee, for example, the, uh, Trump's victory in the 2016 election. But he improvised. He gave himself options. That, on bunt, another word is volia. You know, the, so the, the fear of anarchy, uncontrolled anarchy, which does come back to your point, Celeste, about accountability. It's not that he's accountable in the Western sense. He's not democratically accountable, but he is susceptible to fears of Bund and Volia, and to some extent that makes him responsive to public mood. So I suppose I'm using accountability in the sort of rather generous sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Andre, last word to you very briefly as we are wrapping it up. Sure, <laughs> there were very brief associations with economics. So <laughs> I should say I would be very glad if uh, in mass media I will mention personally the shift from international to internal agenda and very serious economic problems uh, which are rather dull for discussion but they are very urgent and if they will be put on priority list that would be for the best of Russia and the whole world. All right, I just want to invite everybody for coffee um, on me and uh, have everybody be back in this room <laughs> at 11.30 and join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>